Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Devada Satyanathan. I'm a lawyer at Raja and Khan, Singapore. I started my career clerking at the Supreme Court and I've been with the Arbitration and Construction Practice Group at Raja and Khan for slightly over six years now. And welcome to this webinar, starting off on the right foot. We're here to talk about um, arbitration and consent, which lies at the heart of arbitration. Many of us get into an arbitration eager to resolve the substance of the dispute, uh, as is the case with many parties, but often get tripped up uh, by procedural issues. For example, a pathological arbitration clause, or uh, they find out that they may have uh, deliberately or inadvertently repudiated the arbitration agreement, uh, and they face jurisdictional challenges down the line or setting aside proceedings. So we are here to talk about how we can uh, ideally circumvent those, or, or if you're on the other side, to exploit those um, by setting off on the right foot or, or calling people out when they don't set off on the right foot. Some brief ground rules first. We're going to go through three illustrious speakers who will be talking for about 10 minutes each. And I ask that as they are speaking, in fact, as questions come to mind now, please enter your questions into the Q&A. I will be looking at them intently uh, as each of the speakers are speaking and I will be putting your questions to them uh, either uh, through the chat function or at the end of uh, the respective presentations. Now, a brief introduction to each of the three wonderful speakers we have today from around the world. First, uh, Mr. Baba Jimmy, one of the founding partners of The New Practice in Nigeria. He's actively involved in the arbitration space, both as advocate and arbitrator, and he heads the firm's fintech and e-commerce group. So if you need any NFT advice, what to buy, I think Baba Jimmy is your man. Second, Johannes, based in Gabriel Arbitration in Switzerland. He was called to the bar in Switzerland, Germany, and England and Wales. He's an international man of mystery. Uh, he's also incidentally spent time with us here at Raja and Tan, Singapore, and we remember him very fondly. Third, Julian, partner in, uh, at Abraham's Knees Lawyers, based in Melbourne. More than 15 years experience as a disputes lawyer. Uh, again, toggling between court and arbitration. And he himself has spent time in Switzerland and bumped into uh, Johanna. So we are all connected in an intricate web uh, in this uh, panel discussion. Without further ado, I'll kick things off by passing over to Baba Jimmy, who will take us through from day one consent all the way through to concepts of vitiation of that consent and pathological arbitration clauses. Over to you, Baba Jimmy. Thank you, Dev. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, well, it's still morning in Lagos, Nigeria, um, where I am. Um, so I'm going to, and thanks to SIAC um, for having me here. Um, so I'm going to talk um, for a few minutes about consent and the role it plays in arbitration, especially um, in Nigeria, which is where I practice. Um, consent um, is simply permission or agreement to do something. Um, and under Nigerian law, um, consent is so, is so important in terms of arbitration. It's, um, it's at the heart of the entire arbitral process. Um, I like to say it's the foundation of the arbitral process um, in Nigeria. And um, you can see this um, from our major arbitration statute, which is the Arbitration and Conciliation Act. Um, it's modeled after the Oncetral model um, law. So a lot of the provisions in there are provisions that uh, most arbitration practitioners around the world um, will be familiar with. And one of the most important provisions there, right, is it's section one which essentially says that all arbitration agreements uh, must be in writing. And then it goes further to say that the writing must be contained um, in a document signed by the parties or in an exchange of communications between parties. 
or in an exchange of pleadings. So one party alleges the existence of um, an arbitration agreement in his or her points of claim. And then the other party accepts that such an arbitration agreement um, does exist. I think the key point to note from that section is that by requiring that the document has to be signed by the parties, right? And by also um, having the requirement for an exchange, even when the document is not, is not signed, um, it's, it's clear that um, the statute um, is emphasizing consent because obviously by signing the document or by exchanging um, the correspondence and the pleadings, both parties are actually agreeing and acknowledging the existence of um, an arbitration agreement. So you can see that um, even from the basic um, statutes, it is clear that um, consent is important and crucial to the process. Um, Nigerian law also recognizes the concept of party autonomy, um, which um, relies on consent of the parties. And then um, I think the whole issue of consent is even uh, more apparent when you look at the way uh, arbitration statutes has been, um, has been framed. Um, you would find that apart from the very few mandatory provisions um, in the arbitration statute, um, the statute essentially leaves the parties to agree on how they want the arbitration to work. Um, it's only when parties are unable to agree uh, that the default provisions then kick in. Um, so what are the common issues around context, uh, around consent um, in, in the Nigerian jurisdiction? Um, I'm sure by the time I go through um, some of these, you would find that quite a number of them occur in other parts of, of the world too. Um, but I think the most common issue around consent is where a party uh, in breach of an arbitration agreement goes ahead to institute an action in court. We've got loads of cases on that in Nigeria and uh, we could spend the next two days discussing that. Um, but I think the crucial thing to point out is that when a party does that, um, what they're essentially doing, um, even though they don't say it, is that they're withdrawing the consent that they had earlier given um, to go to arbitration if there was a dispute. Um, another instance or another issue around consent that we usually see, right, is um, where a party gets into an agreement that has an arbitration clause embedded in it, and then a dispute arises, and one of the parties um, claims that um, that dispute isn't arbitrable, right? Um, that, in a way, is also... Um, a repudiation of the, the agreement to arbitrate because how do you get into an agreement? You sign the agreement and then turn around and say the same agreement that you had signed, um, the issues are now um, not arbitrable. Um, another area where we have um, you know, issues around consent is with fraud. Sometimes you find that parties who want to get out of their um, agreement to arbitrate alleged fraud. As we say in most common law jurisdictions, um, fraud vitiates everything. And um, there are actually decisions of Ni the Nigerian court that state that where you allege the existence of fraud and the fraud touches on the arbitration agreement itself or the substantive agreement, an arbitral tribunal cannot decide on that issue. It has to be the court. So obviously anybody who wants to withdraw their consent, um, the consent they had earlier given um, to arbitrate, um, would want to take advantage of that. Um, then another scenario that one sees um, regularly is where you have pathological arbitration clauses. Um, quite often, there's the issue of whether there was consent in the first place. Um, two different parties have different interpretations of an arbitration clause. Obviously, this is more likely to happen where the arbitration clause is not properly drafted. So you've got a, um, a wide range of cases that have had to basically wade through this issue of how to deal with um, pathological arbitration clauses. And I'll be happy to um, talk about them 
uh, more in depth if I do have enough time at the end of this. Um, and then I think the last area that I'd probably like to draw attention to is the issue of non-compliance with either the arbitration statute or an arbitration agreement. Um, what the arbitration statute says in section 33 is that where a party is aware of a non-compliance with the arbitration agreement or with the arbitration um, statute, but yet continues and participates in the arbitration proceedings, that party would have been deemed um, to have waived that non-compliance and um, obviously will be deemed to have given its consent to the arbitration proceedings that had taken place, even though they were not in compliance um, with the agreement. Um, so I think I can stop here and hand over to Dev. And um, if there's more time, I'll be happy to share some examples of um, the issues I've, I've discussed. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Baba Jimmy. Uh, just a reminder to everyone, you can send in your questions through the Q&A uh, function. There's some coming in. Uh, you can keep them coming and we'll um, deal with them in, in the best way we can manage. Uh, just picking up on one point, uh, Baba Jimmy mentioned the idea that a party uh, breaches an arbitration agreement when it goes to court. That tends to be the, the most obvious case of a party breaching an arbitration agreement, typically relied on by the other side as a repudiation of that arbitration agreement. Of course, there are uh, complications down the line. What exactly that party went to court to do um, and how the other party responded in the court proceedings, uh, both both matter very much. If there's time, uh, moderator might become panelist at the end of this. Uh, and I'll talk a bit about a recent Court of Appeal decision in Singapore, touching on precisely these issues. Uh, but, but if not, we'll hear from the far more capable speakers for the duration of this seminar. Uh, speaking of, over to Johannes, who will be taking us through a scenario and some pointers in typical professorial style. Over to you, Johannes. Thank you, Deb. I hope that hasn't scared anyone away. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening. We have speakers from about every time zone and I hope also listeners from every time zone. So as Dev said, I want to go into a bit more detail. Um, Baba Jimmy has explained the overall context uh, of arbitration and consent that would be about the same thing in Switzerland or in uh, Germany, but then obviously the details are a bit different and we put this into practice in a slightly different manner. So about the factual scenario, that just that we're all on the same page, let's assume the parties have agreed on arbitration proceedings, but one of the parties then commences state court proceedings instead. Now the other side has basically three options how they can react. They can first object to the state court's jurisdiction and invoke the arbitration agreement. That's not what we want to talk about here. Uh, second, they can accept these state court proceedings in the sense of um, agreeing to waive or however you want to call this the arbitration agreement. And the third possibility is they simply remain silent. Now, what is the impact of this party behavior on both sides on the arbitration agreement, putting it in a non-technical manner, or if we want to put it in a more technical, in more technical terms, does this party behavior render the corresponding arbitration agreement null and void? By which I mean, are the parties then barred from invoking this same arbitration agreement further down the road? Now, before we get into this, how would the courts react to this party behavior um, if the respondent doesn't object to the jurisdiction of the court because of the arbitration agreement or stay silent? The solution is straightforward. German or Swiss courts would simply continue with the proceedings and then render a decision. The arbitration agreement doesn't um, derogate the court's jurisdiction. They still remain competent unless the arbitration agreement were invoked. Now back to the scenario. I want to discuss this basically in five steps to make it also a bit more practical and not talk only about case law. Um, first, the question would be, why would anyone even commence state court proceedings despite the arbitration agreement? What could the considerations be? Second, why would a party uh, on the other side then not object 
even though there's an arbitration agreement. Three, why would a party want to nevertheless invoke the arbitration agreement later on? So they basically change their mind on that point. Then I briefly want to discuss a German case dealing with precisely this scenario and conclude with a few practical considerations on how you can implement um, these decisions in practice. Now, why would anyone commence stakeholder proceedings in the first place, despite having agreed on arbitration? I see from my practice and also the sort of the German uh, civil law perspective, three reasons. The first would be there's a specific procedure available in the courts that might be beneficial. Uh, small claims procedure, summary proceedings, um, as the common lawyers would call it. Um, we would call it more documents only procedure, that, that kind of stuff. That could be more efficient than the usual arbitration proceedings. So the parties might want to do this, or at least the claimant might want to try this. Second, a possibility is that you expect already the other side not to show up. So you are basically aiming at a default judgment from the start. That can happen in arbitration as well, but uh, in the arbitration proceedings, if the other side doesn't participate, it's a bit more complicated because you need to set up the tribunal. Uh, you might have to involve the institution or state courts even to set up the tribunal. If the other side doesn't cooperate, you have to pre-finance the whole thing and then it's a bit more burdensome if the other side doesn't participate. They always need to be put on notice for everything. Um, so this might be uh, not the most efficient way if you know already that the other side will not participate, either because they've told you so, they have no money, they, are, they have disappeared. That might also be better to go to state courts. And the third reason is purely tactical. You try to annoy the other side. I mean, you have an objection agreement, but you say, whatever, let the other side uh, complain about it. Now going to the other side, uh, the second point, why would the respondent not object? Again, three reasons I think. First is they might be happy with the specific procedure available. Documents only might actually work for them as well. So they say, well, let's have this faster and cheaper than in the normal arbitral process. Second, um, they might stay silent because they want to save costs, either because they um, don't even have any money or they just want to save it for, for other purposes. And the third reason, again, tactical, they try to obstruct the proceedings by not showing up, by hoping that, um, that the claimant has a problem, maybe at the enforcement stage and so on and so forth. Now, this is the reason why you might want to go to state courts in the first place, but then why do you change your mind later on? Later on, the case may be different, the dispute may be different, even though on the basis of the same arbitra uh, arbitration agreement, namely the dispute might be more complex, you might need witnesses, it might be a higher value in dispute, and then all these considerations don't apply anymore. Small claims is not a good idea, documents only is not a good idea, so you want to um, continue, or you want to initiate arbitration proceedings on the arbitration agreement basis and not go to state courts for the next claim even though arising out of the same transaction. Now to this case from the German Supreme Court that I promised. The decision is relatively straightforward. It says that if the parties by consent appeal to a state court, or if one of the parties approaches a court and the other side doesn't object, then they are deemed to have repealed the validity of the arbitration agreement, and I quote, solely with regard to the dispute in question. So we're not thinking about the arbitration agreement overall. We're thinking exclusively about the dispute. Now, what does dispute mean? That is a concept of German civil procedure, the same in Switzerland. It's basically the claim raised, and that's linked to the rest judicata concept. So how much you claim you bring at the end that will um, become res judicata. And that is based on the facts that you invoke plus the prayer, of, uh, prayer for relief. So you invoke, for instance, a uh, construction project, and then you claim 1 million for this and that problem. That is your dispute. If on the same basis, same construction project, next time you ask for 2 million based on something else, that's a different dispute. So the court says, you bring the case on the basis of the first set of facts plus prayer for relief. 
that is your dispute. And for that part of, for that dispute, you have waived the arbitration agreement by going to court. For everything else, the arbitration agreement stays in place. So the arbitration agreement is not repudiated by initiating state court proceedings. And to conclude with a few practical considerations, parties in Germany are of course free to repeal arbitration agreements if they want to, if they want to do so on a consensual basis. Um, the trickier part is if the claimant unilaterally decides to approach a state court instead of uh, the arbitral uh, tribunal. If the respondent objects, that's straightforward uh, because then the court would have to stop the proceedings, you go to arbitration. Whether that's a violation of the arbitration agreement is a different thing. We're reluctant to assume a violation here because the arbitration agreement has to be invoked by the respondent in state court. There's no derogation automatically. So violation may be if the other side has already announced that they would invoke it, but not all the time. If the respondent stay silent, no problem um, either, then the German or Swiss courts would simply continue and render a decision. If the respondent participates in the proceedings, despite there being an arbitration agreement, also no problem. The tricky bit is if the respondent participates, but then later on claims that that meant a waiver of the entire arbitration agreement, because there's obviously also the possibility that you have this offer and acceptance structure. Again, one party offering to revoke the arbitration agreement, the other side accepting it. So that is also a risk that has nothing to do with the case from the Supreme Court. The initiating of the proceedings itself is not enough, but you can always argue, okay, we offered and they accepted or the other way around. So in order to avoid that risk, I would advise that the claimant clearly states, I am bringing this case in the state court despite the arbitration agreement, but I reserve the right to then bring arbitration proceedings for any other dispute. If the respondent objects, you're not, you're not uh, putting them on notice for too much. If they object, they can object anyway. But if they don't object, they can't late, later say, ah, by the way, they waived the arbitration agreement entirely. So if that's not what you want to do, I would clearly um, expressly reserve the possibility to go to arbitration later on. And then just the fact of bringing state court proceedings does in no way waive, uh, terminate, or void the arbitration agreement. That's maybe from my side for the time being. So I hand back to Dev. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy, of course, to discuss them. Thanks very much, Johannes. Um, just a, a couple of points, uh, picking up where Johannes left off with, uh, with the practical tips. Zooming out, this, this whole webinar is about setting off on the right foot. Um, one of the things that I try to do as a disputes lawyer is to check if it's a contractual dispute, to check if there is an arbitration agreement uh, in the contract. Uh, sometimes easier said than done, if there's a multitude of contracts uh, or there's a parent contract and many subcontracts uh, that refer uh, to one another. I, I realize this practice also infects my daily life when I check my terms of use with uh, the, the hundreds of companies we interface on a day-to-day -day basis like Facebook, uh, I'm also desperately looking for the dispute resolution clause. Uh, I, I have to say, I've never gone to dispute with any of these companies, thankfully, uh, personally, um, and I hope to keep it that way. But at least I know uh, how best to start off on the right foot. So first step, I think, is to check so that uh, uh, you won't find yourself um, having to make the very difficult proposition years down the line that you simply did not know there was an arbitration agreement, which was why uh, the conduct in starting court proceedings at the time was not repudiatory. Uh, that was an argument made by lawyers to, to try and get out of a, a repudiation uh, type situation. Um, Another, another point I, I just wanted to touch on that uh, uh, Johannes was talking about uh, different reasons people start in court, for example, despite there being an arbitration agreement. And I think he, uh, he, he um, well, creatively highlighted the, the different the three different possibilities. One uh, that comes to mind in uh, some of the cases I've been involved with is publicity. Uh, court proceedings, at least in Singapore, tend to be uh, public uh, 
in that the media could potentially apply to inspect the case file. Uh, and back when it was pre-COVID times, uh, court hearings were open to anyone who wanted to spectate. Um, so that, that may be a reason to, to hit to court first. Uh, of course, the party doing that would, would have to preempt a, a stay application and would have to think a few steps ahead. Uh, but again, it's about setting off on the right foot. If the idea is a deliberate one uh, to go to court instead of arbitration, it's still prudent to anticipate the counter arguments or obstacles you'd be met with. Um, I'll leave it at that. Uh, again, invitation to send in your questions through the Q&A function. Uh, or we can take it uh, at the end. Uh, for now, we move to our third speaker, Julian, uh, who'll be talking about uh, a company known as Instagram. I'm vaguely acquainted. Uh, I'm not sure if it's my generation or, or yours, Julian, but I'll leave that to you. Over to you, Julian. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here, well, from my home office in Australia. Uh, my presentation fits in extremely well because it uh, dovetails with one of Johannes's trickier situations and a very specific subcategory of those situations, a situation in which a plaintiff company, in this case, an Australian plaintiff company, uh, brought court proceedings and wanted court proceedings, that dialogue, in this case, dialogue v Instagram, brought Australian court proceedings against the giant Instagram and other entities uh, belonging to the even bigger giant Facebook. And it's a very specific situation because there was no question of whether the arbitration agreement that existed in the terms of use contract was repudiated. It ultimately came down to a question of whether the Facebook entities who changed their mind after nine months and suddenly didn't want to be involved in the federal court proceedings anymore were allowed to change their mind and compel a stay of the Australian court proceedings so that the proceeding could be moved to American arbitration. Now, I'm very thankful to speak here today also because when one has a busy disputes practice, as many of you will appreciate, you often don't get the time to sit down and read a 115 page case. And uh, this enabled me to justify that. And it was a very amusing read because the uh, Australian judge involved, Justice Beach, has quite a good turn of phrase. Uh, and he also covered a number of issues that are interesting from all sorts of perspectives about uh, different types of internet contracts many different questions of private international law and how they'll be assessed in a, in, in a country like Australia, that is, which law applies to what, um, all sorts of different questions. But what I propose to focus on today is what's really important for the arbitration practitioner. I wouldn't say that Justice Beach is a classic arbitration practitioner, but he sits in the Australian court that deals with most arbitration cases. So the case is a really important reminder of the fact that when we have commercial disputes, there's often a choice involved between arbitration and something else. And it always makes me think this kind of situation that one shouldn't be, one should always be a commercial disputes lawyer and not simply a litigation lawyer or simply an arbitration lawyer. Because a single focus on one of litigation or arbitration might prevent us from seeing the whole picture and therefore from properly availing ourselves of different strategic options that we can use to help our clients. So I haven't got too much time to go into this wonderful case. So I'll just set out some of the interesting facts of it in the first place, tell you about some of the arguments so that they're on your radar, the kind of arguments that can be used for and against suspending court proceedings to go to arbitration and give you some personal reflections on the cases I do so. So first of all, on the facts, because I know you're all curious. Uh, Dialogue Consulting is a, a small Melbourne-based uh, Australian IT company. It's entirely owned by one individual alone, a man called Small uh, Hugh Stevens, and it's small enough to have fewer than 20 employees, which was actually not just 
important for David and Goliath analogies, but also for the application of what are called unfair contract terms provisions in Australian consumer law. If there's a very small company against a very big company and the contract term is unfair and one-sided, it can be voided out. And that was pleaded in this case. So this little company dialogue runs a software service that basically allows people to, uh, companies and businesses around the world to ping content to Instagram all through the night, because apparently beforehand, uh, people were setting alarms to wake up in the middle of the night to advertise their brand on Instagram. So this gentleman saw a gap in the market and he created scheduling and posting software. The problem is that by doing so, he, to some degree, got involved in something that Facebook wanted to do because he was allowing clients of his effectively to avoid paid content by using unpaid content posts to advertise their, their brand. And Facebook and Instagram very quickly got annoyed and said, you're breaching our terms of use because of course he'd had to open accounts and employees of Dialog had had to open accounts. Um, terms of use including you can't solicit, collect or use logging credentials, you can't crawl and scrape or cache Instagram content. And after, coincidentally, Instagram launched its own scheduling content publishing API, they then banned Dialog and deleted all their posts and got a lot more aggressive, even though they'd been talking throughout a five-year period before that. So Dialog brought Australian court proceedings because they were seeking an injunction. But in the contract, when they'd opened the account, the terms of use, there was a very prominent bold type caps arbitration notice saying you agree that between you and Instagram all disputes will be resolved by binding individual arbitration under AAA rules in the US. So initially they had difficulty serving the other party then White and Case the uh, Facebook entities US lawyers wrote and initially reserved their rights to jurisdiction did nothing else, appointed some Australian lawyers who fully participated in the proceedings. Unconditional appearances, what we call just, I'm here, no mention of the arbitration clause, I'm here as a lawyer, here's my address. A defence in which they referred extensively to the terms of use, but didn't mention the arbitration clause. Another defence where they did the same thing. What we call requests for further and better particulars, this would be familiar to many of you discovery categories, the whole way through to a court-ordered mediation. And then when the court-ordered mediation failed, suddenly that firm, Gaydens, was removed. Another Australian firm was brought on by the Facebook entities and they're talking about the arbitration clause and trying to get the Australian court proceedings stayed and shift it to arbitration. So the case was decided under a clause seven of the Australian International Arbitration Act, which dates from 1974. Australia is a model law jurisdiction, but this clause predates the model law and is slightly different in one crucial respect in that under the model law article eight, a court before which an action is brought when it's subject to an arbitration agreement shall be referred to arbitration if a party so requests not later than when submitting its first statement on the substance of the dispute. So there's a clear time period. The Australian provision is almost exactly the same, but doesn't have the you must request not later when submitting your first statement on the substance of the dispute. Now, given that the Facebook entities have put in a defence, which is a a statement on the substance of the dispute. If the Australian provision had mirrored exactly the model law, there wouldn't have been a case that had got to that got to the federal court at all. Um, it would have been easily resolved. But because there wasn't, we then had a roundabout way of treating it with all these other arguments that actually turned out to be particularly interesting. I can't go through all of them because I want to focus on waiver and I haven't got that much time, 
But the Facebook entity said, oh, no, it's the competence, competence principle. You need this to be decided by the arbitrator. Therefore, you must immediately stay at the minute there's a question of the, an arbitration agreement. Um, that was rejected by the Australian judge, not on the basis that I would have done it as an arbitration practitioner, which would have been just the competence, competence principle doesn't imply exclusive jurisdiction over competence questions for the arbitrator. But on the classic Australian judge way of doing things, he said, I think there's discretion and I'm best placed to decide this question, so I will. And then we had the arguments such as I referred to before from Dialogue, who didn't want to go to American arbitration, saying, oh, it wasn't obvious enough to us, this arbitration clause. The court threw that out, saying, you might have clicked not signed, but you still had reasonable notice of the arbitration clause. And Baba Jimmy, as an e-commerce specialist, you'd know about this. A click can be enough to assent to terms. So you've consented. They said the arbitration clause didn't apply to all of the claims. They said it was an unfair contract term, but the court said it's really not that unfair. Um, interestingly, on the unfair contract term, just for general arbitration knowledge, they invoked as part of its unfairness the fact that they would have to employ US lawyers who were experts in AAA arbitration, and that would be unfair. Uh, it would create asymmetry in favour of the Facebook entities. The court came back and said, there's always unequal bargaining power. You don't need to choose a third state. The term is neither unfair nor unconscionable. So all those arguments were thrown out, and we came down to this question that we've already mentioned in previous presentations of had Facebook, by participating for nine months in the proceedings in the Australian courts, waived their rights to subsequently say, hey, look here, arbitration clause, take it out of the Australian courts and send it to arbitration. And that, in, under Australian law, came under a bit of the provision that is also in the model law, which is whether the arbit a, a disclaimer that you don't have to move the arbitration in light of an arbitration agreement, if that agreement is null and void, inoperative, or incapable of being performed. Now, interestingly, the Australian court saw it a bit differently and looked more at performance and using equitable notions that are used in common law systems, said, it, you have waived the right to perform this on the Facebook entity side. Um, under private international law, the judge decided the waiver question as a matter of US law, but ultimately said that he could have decided it the same way under Australian law and listed over at least 10 or 15 pages all the different factors that can be considered as to whether, the, whether there is a waiver. Were the party's actions inconsistent with the right to arbitrate? Was the litigation machinery invoked? Was there a big delay? Did they file a counterclaim? Was there prejudice? Did they take advantage of discovery procedures that aren't available in arbitration? All of these questions. Ultimately, as you could probably guess, he said, they've delayed too long with all these defences and unconditional appearances. The public policy benefits of arbitration, which he described as expeditious, efficient and cost-effective, were effectively annihilated by the delay and the heavy litigation before the Australian courts. And therefore there was a waiver. So he didn't have to refer the case to arbitration. What's really interesting, and this is the last point on what he said, is that he didn't just stop there and say, there's been a waiver um, on the basis of my consideration of all these factors. He said, I am prepared to infer as a judge that the Australian lawyers chose deliberately not to plead the arbitration clause, a deliberate and intentional waiver. And that was important because there was even a no waiver clause in the Facebook, in the Instagram terms of use. But he said, that's for inadvertent waivers. This was a deliberate waiver. That's what I found on the evidence. So you can't use the no waiver clause. Um, just one point that wasn't made that I think is really important from the perspective of an Australian and many other uh, practitioners that wasn't mentioned, but I think definitely played a role, 
Gaydens basically took, that's the first Australian firm for the Facebook entity, uh, entities, took the case through a nine month period all the way to mediation. And it was only after mediation, as I mentioned, that the whole approach changed. It was after the mediation failed. Now in Australia and in Victoria, where this case was held in particular, a huge number, a huge percentage, I think the highest in the world almost, of commercial cases settle and usually at that court mediation. This is due to a strict cost regime, which basically forces you to gamble really hard if you don't settle, even more than you would normally gamble in commercial litigation. And this means that the Australian lawyers often don't think to the very end and may have thought, we only get, need to get this to mediation with a decent bargaining position and we'll resolve this. Why would we go to all the hassle of an international arbitration when we can barrel it through the Australian court system and sort it out at mediation as we do with 99% of our commercial cases? And it's in that context that the judges finding that the Facebook entities deliberately chose not to invoke the arbitration clause makes a little bit more sense because usually you wouldn't give up a procedural right that you put in the contract to your, yourself and that helps you. But where you think you're gonna get out of it with a court ordered mediation because of the structure of that system, you may do so. And that's certainly reflective of, of my experience where I will ignore an extra mediation clause because I know that it's likely to get done at the court mediation anyway. And I don't wanna waste the client's time and money in the meantime. So it was a, it's, it's a fascinating case. I think it, it shows a number of the issues in that specific but quite common situation where a defendant or a respondent could take it to arbitration, but hesitates and then loses the right. Thanks very much, Julian. Uh, you've brought 115 pages, so a portion of it to life. That's, that's not something many of us can do. Um, uh, extremely engaging. Um, I'm almost tempted to read it, almost. Um, a common theme I know that, that seems to run across the, the three presentations we've seen uh, is that arbitration clauses generally fall to be dealt with according to traditional contract law uh, principles. What, while that may seem uh, uncontroversial, uh, there, there are two bits that may give rise to some controversy. First, it, Arbitration clauses are technically considered a separate uh, contract. Um, so, so that means uh, at times, a different law may apply to that contract within the contract, the main contract. Uh, and, and much ink has been spilled, I'm sure in many jurisdictions and Singapore is no exception over what is the proper approach as a matter of conflicts to determine that law. Uh, and so even before you get to the question of which uh, set of traditional contract law principles apply, as in which jurisdictions set, uh, you, you might be um, uh, uh, faced with the obstacle of which conflicts rule um, applies. There's a relatively recent UK Supreme Court decision on this, and the position in Singapore is still to a certain extent up for debate. So lots of excitement there, even before you get off the starting blocks. Now, the second interesting bit about this relatively uncontroversial proposition that traditional contract law principles apply is that no one really bothers with the dispute resolution clause when drafting the contract. Um, and, and that's, I, I think, in part because if, uh, if one side were extremely concerned about the dispute resolution clause, it may give the other side uh, some concern that a dispute is not too far down the line. Uh, but I'm sure there are many other reasons for that. Uh, it's typically seen as part of boilerplate. That view is changing, um, but it's still, uh, I think, uh, the prevailing view in many quarters. One of the questions that came through from the uh, participants today was, uh, is there a need for consent? Now that's deeply philosophical. And on a Friday afternoon, I'm not sure I, I have the ability to go into it. It's technically Baba Jimmy's morning, uh, so he might be better suited. But I, I think this is what maybe that, that question gets at, uh, that arbitration clauses are really something parties uh, hammer out from term sheet to negotiating table to, to final draft. 
Um, and when it comes to court, there is some artificiality about it, some artificiality around arguing how it should be construed uh, and what exactly consent means. I'll just briefly touch on for the next um, two or three minutes, a recent Singapore decision by the Court of Appeal, Marty. It's 30 pages, not 115 pages, um, and perhaps less exciting reading. Uh, but Marty talks about uh, the main argument in Marty was the repudiation of an arbitration agreement. The respondent in that case commenced a BVI proceeding, court proceeding, uh, even as there was an arbitration agreement in the contract that was the subject of dispute. And this was the case I was alluding to earlier, where the lawyer's explanation for not having commenced arbitration from day one was that the arbitration clause was simply missed uh, or glossed over by the parties at the time. Uh, that, that uh, as a matter of fact, was rejected by the Court of Appeal as not being substantiated by uh, proper evidence. But what is interesting is the Court of Appeal's analysis on uh, how uh, the law on repudiation works. One of the most uh, perhaps it wasn't intended to be controversial, but it's been interpreted as controversial. Uh, statements by the court was that there's a presumption of repudiation when court proceedings are commenced. Uh, and the court, the court said, and I quote, it is strongly arguable that the commencement of court proceedings is itself a prima facie repudiation of the arbitration agreement, end quote. Um, now, why this is controversial is there may be many reasons for commencing court proceedings. In an extreme example, court proceedings may be commenced to support uh, an arbitration that's about to be commenced, for instance, by seeking early injunctive relief. In a case like that, uh, it would be difficult to argue that commencing court proceedings there, uh, while reserving the right to arbitrate down the line, for example, is repudiatory. Um, and, and that's not what the Court of Appeal was intending to capture. In fact, a full read of the judgment would make very clear that that uh, wasn't the case on the facts. Uh, but this court uh, may give rise to some debate as to whether the position in Singapore has shifted such that as long as you commence court proceedings, uh, the burden in a sense shifts to you to show why that is not repudiatory uh, and that itself could um, have some effect, uh, be the subject of some controversy. So that's Marty. I invite you to take a look at the case. The citation is 2018 to SLR 1207. It's a short read, an easy read, uh, and there are a couple of other concepts there that may be um, interesting to everyone. But for now, I want to come back to the speakers. I have a couple of questions um, presented. The first uh, is when arbitration is initiated by one party and the respondent does not appear but later on objects the appointment of arbitrator was without consent of the respondent or objects to the jurisdiction of the tribunal, what would be the scenario? So it's, it's your typical uh, uh, maneuver by the respondent to not appear uh, and then regret in a fear of missing out uh, manner. Uh, Johannes, I think you, you touched on uh, the strategic angles around what a party might or might not do. Um, what, what are your thoughts on this? If a party does not appear initially um, and arbitration goes down the road of appointment, possibly building up to a hearing, and then the respondent comes in, let's say you were counsel for that respondent, how would you try to join the party again? Yeah, I think if in practical terms, you can always show up um, if uh, you, you're still a party and the others will be happy that you finally appeared. Uh, we had this in one case where the party showed up at the eve of a hearing and uh, then we could send an email to everyone, oh, by the way, they are actually gonna participate. Um, Initially, of course, you have deadlines for appointing an arbitrator and you have deadlines um, also for objecting to the jurisdiction. If you, have not, if you have missed these deadlines, you have basically waived your right to object to jurisdiction and also your right to appoint an arbitrator. So I don't see a problem there normally. 
Um, later on, you can always participate, but I don't think you can derail the arbitration by then objecting to the arbitrator, for instance, that's sitting there. Unless you have found a new reason to um, challenge the arbitrator, but that also is subject to deadlines. Thanks, Johannes. Um, I, I, I'll move on to another question, if, unless, unless any of the other speakers have, have more to say on this. Um, there's a question I think that picks up of Marty. Do you slash your courts have a view on whether a party could really be said to waive an arbitration agreement? There's been some sentiment in Singapore that parties to an arbitration agreement might not have a true choice between two inconsistent rights necessary for a waiver by election, since they also have an obligation to arbitrate. Uh, now, to provide some context, I, I think that might be where it's coming from. That was said in Marty. In Marty, aside from repudiation, one argument that was run was that the, uh, uh, the respondent had waived its right to arbitrate by commencing court proceedings. And the court uh, didn't technically have to deal with it because the entire case was disposed of uh, on repudiation, but made a comment that uh, there's some doubt as to whether waiver could apply when it comes to an arbitration agreement, because you don't have the case of two inconsistent rights. You simply have an obligation to arbitrate. Um, Julian, I wonder if you have any views on this, given that uh, the Instagram case did discuss uh, waiver, and that was also my, my interest in the Instagram case, given that the position in Singapore, I think, is not as clear, or rather, if one were to head to the High Court uh, or even the Court of Appeal, um, uh, one might be cautious about, about uh, pinning a case to uh, a waiver when it comes to an arbitration agreement. I think the first thing I'd say on that is from from the perspective of the case, if not Australian law generally, first of all, you would never say that a party in the position of dialogue uh, repudiated the arbitration agreement because that would then effectively take the question away before it was even asked because the respondent, in this case, the Facebook entities, wouldn't have been able to try and compel an agreement that was no longer in force except by seeking specific performance of it after repudiation. It puts them to a different type of election. Um, so it, it makes more sense in the Australian context to say it remains operative and it comes down to the equitable nature of the exercise of the contractual right. Um, and as many of you would know, we have a strong tradition of estoppel in this jurisdiction that has to some degree been ex exported. And uh, it also comes with a notion of election. It's funny because it reminds me of another, the, the approach reminds me of the uh, approach used in public international law, where consent is also a key element of jurisdiction, where you can go to the ICJ, for example, even though you're not a party, just because after you have been sued in the ICJ as a state, you can decide to go anyway. You're almost put to an election. And while there is not the situation of manifestly inconsistent alternatives in law, there is a sense in Australian law of if the clause is there, you are put to an election as to whether to invoke it or not if you're sued in an Australian court. So I don't think the, it's, it's, it's interesting because it's not viewed in a strict contractual sense at all in this jurisdiction. Could Thanks. I make one comment, Dave? Go ahead. From a civil law perspective. I, will, I will never say no to you. Go ahead. Um, because for me, this is not inconsistent uh, um, obligations anyway. We have the concept of alternative fora. So you can choose between different courts that are competent. You can also have a choice of court agreements for different courts, or you can have a choice of court agreement in addition to your general jurisdiction rules. And then the claimant can choose. You can, of course, say that it is inconsistent to go to Singapore or to Germany because the rules are very different. But we have this uh, approach that you can choose as the claimant. So with the arbitration agreements, it's the same. It's an additional alternative forum. And you can choose one or the other. That's the jurisdictional aspect. 
Then the other aspect is the substantive. Are you obliged to do it? And what happens if you don't and the other side invokes it? But on the purely jurisdictional um, level, I don't see it as a contradiction because it does not derogate from the state court's jurisdiction. Respondent always has to invoke it. And before they have invoked it, the court does not lose jurisdiction. And until that moment, it is not contradictory. Thanks very much, uh, Johannes. Now, if I had to run an argument on Weaver, I know which two doctors to go to first uh, to, to seek aid. Uh, Baba Jimmy, I want to ask you something. You talked about pathological arbitration clauses and, uh, and fraud, fraud uh, unraveling all. Um, you mentioned you had a couple of examples to mind, if time permits. We have about four minutes. Uh, are there any uh, particularly interesting examples on pathological arbitration clauses or on, on fraud unraveling an arbitration clause that uh, you'd like to take us through? Well, yeah, so um, as recently as 2019, the Supreme Court in Nigeria had cause to um, decide a case. Uh, it's um, called Imokwede, I'm sorry, Mekunye versus Imokwede. And um, in that case, uh, one of the issues was about a clause that um, was determined to be pathological or was alleged to be pathological. Um, in the arbitration agreement, um, the parties had specified a default appointing authority. And that authority or that um, default appointer was um, the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, London. Um, so one of the parties raised an objection and said, there isn't any institution called Chartered Institute of Arbitrators London. According to that party, the proper name of the appointing authority um, was Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, uh, Nigeria branch in brackets. So Chartered Institute of Arbitrators UK, Nigeria branch in, in bracket. Um, the Supreme Court threw out that argument and the Supreme Court said, look, um, when you have a pathological arbitration clause, um, the attitude of the court should be to look at the entire agreement between the parties. And once you can discern an intention to arbitrate um, from the words used, no matter how pathological they are, the court has a duty to give effect um, to that intention. Um, so uh, the way the Supreme Court resolved that was that even though that appointing authority was referred to in a way that it was generally not uh, referred to, there was no doubt between the parties who they wanted to appoint as the appointing authority. And there was no doubt from the way the agreement was drafted that um, they wanted to go to arbitration. So the Supreme Court uh, threw out that argument. Uh, I think that generally... Um, indicates the way the Nigerian courts would deal with um, such issues. Thanks very much, um, Baba Jimmy. That, that's a, it's another, yeah. I, perhaps a third point that, that's interesting to the idea that it's usually traditional contract law principles that apply. Uh, there were a couple of Singapore court decisions some years ago that articulated a pro-arbitration view to certain aspects, uh, including possibly the interpretation of a clause to try and uh, stave off uh, pathology, uh, one main counter argument to that is if it's simply intentions of parties that apply, uh, how, how does a pro-arbitration view uh, skew that process and whether it detracts from giving effect to the intentions of parties? I see we have one minute. We are bleeding into a Friday uh, for those of us uh, on the other side of GMT uh, and Baba Jimmy has a long day ahead of him. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us. We have over 100 people from all over the world uh, and our uh, speakers as well, dialing in from all over the world. It's a pleasure uh, meeting all of you again, unfortunately on Zoom. We'll definitely meet in person when conditions permit. Thanks very much to SIAC and YSIAC for making this happen as well. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone.